It's Parsha's Bahar. It's everyone's favorite time of the week. It's time for the Parsha podcast, so let's begin. Our Parsha begins with the laws of Shemitah, the agricultural Sabbath. For six years, you do all the work. You prepare the field, you plow, you plant, you trim, you prune, you harvest, you manage the field. On year seven, it's like Shabbos. Six days you work, one day you're off. Six years you work, and one year you are off. You must refrain from doing any of the work that you typically do on a year in in, in your field. Now, this prohibition actually begins in year six at whatever juncture in year six. Any work in a field is no longer beneficial for that year's crop, meaning the work that you would do at that point in the year would be beneficial only for the upcoming year year's crop, you have to stop on year six. That's the set of restrictions, number one. No work can be done on the field for an entire year. Number two, you must relinquish ownership of the fruits, the incidental fruits that grow on that year. It's free for all. You cannot put a big sign, no trespassing, smile, you're on camera, beware of dog, no signs. You cannot lock the gate. You cannot deny access to anyone. Anyone can walk in. They can walk in, take what they want. You cannot compel them to pay. You cannot accept payment from anyone who walks in. Everyone can stock up in your field. They walk into your field. The deed is under your name. The title is under your name. It's your ancestral land. doesn't matter. For one year, all the fruits are ownerless. And you cannot do business with it. You cannot sell it. You cannot buy it. You cannot export it. You can't even throw it out because the fruits are holy. They are sanctified. And of course, we're just giving a very brief overview, but the details are absolutely vast and voluminous. There's a whole book of Mishnah, a book of Talmud on it. And that, of course, is this is the first law of our parsha. It's actually featured earlier in the Torah. But this uh, this halacha, this law, is detailed extensively in our parsha. I want to focus on the first comment that you find in Rashi. Very often, the iconic teaching in Rashi from a given parsha is, is the first one, and certainly that case in in our parsha. Rashi observes that there's an unusual introduction to our parsha. You know, we're towards the end of Leviticus. We're not uh, exactly novices. We've read a lot of the Torah so far. And we know the Jewish people in the beginning of the book of Exodus, they were in Egypt and they left. They have the miraculous Exodus and they end up in, in Sinai, by Mount Sinai. And the last that we've heard of the people location-wise, they've, they've been at Sinai ever since. But the first verse of our parsha tells us that God spoke to Moshe, Behar Sinai. In fact, the name of our parsha is, is Behar. Behar meaning in the mountain. Behar, in the mountain. God spoke to Moshe in the mountain, at the mountain, at Mount Sinai. And he tells him, speak to the Jewish people, speak to the Israelites, and tell them when you go to the land that I am giving you, i.e. when you finally enter the land, it's going to take them a long time. It's going to be 40 years and 42 different stations where they stopped, where they encamped. But when you arrive, Vishav Saha Aretz, Shabbos Lashem, the land should rest, a Sabbath for God. And it details what you could do and what you cannot do. Six years you work, seventh year it is Sabbath. But Rashi observes that, you know, they have not left Mount Sinai since they arrived in the middle of, of Exodus. So for the rest of Exodus and hitherto in Leviticus, they've been, they've been at, at Sinai. So why does the Torah tell us that God's brought to Moshe at Mount Sinai? Why is it telling us information that we know already? And this is, you know, the ironclad principle. Certainly when you, when you read Rashi, you get an appreciation for this. The ironclad principle is that there's nothing extra. There's nothing unnecessary. There's no redundancy. There's no just, Filler material in the Torah. So why does the verse have to say, God spoke to Moshe, Behar Sinai at Mount Sinai? That's Rashi's question, the first comment in his commentary to our Parsha. And he observes, well, all the mitzvahs were given 
at Sinai. Everything we've had so far, and really everything we're going to have even later on, as we shall see. All the mitzvahs were given at Sinai. So why is this mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shemitah, the mitzvah to have the land lay fallow, the agricultural Sabbath? Why, for this mitzvah, do we get this introduction, this preamble, God spoke to Moshe Behar Sinai at Mount Sinai? Says Rashi, this is the answer. Just as the laws of Shemitah, it was set at Sinai, not just the general law, but the, the principles and the details and the minutia, everything was said at Sinai. So too, all other mitzvos, even the ones that we don't know for sure were said at Sinai, for example, the new mitzvos that are introduced in the book of Devarim, the mitzvos that we first find out when we are in, in other places like in primarily in, in the plains of Moab, the last station where the nation encamps, there are mitzvahs that we read about only there. So you may have thought, Rashi tells us, you may have mistakenly assumed that maybe some mitzvahs were not conveyed at Sinai, they were conveyed later on. And in order to dispel that mistaken notion, we're told that the laws of Shemitah, all the laws of Shemitah, were all said at Sinai. And the technical legalese over here is that this is uh, what's called a, a mamatzino in the Talmudic lingo. If this is all conveyed at Sinai, this we know that for sure, then unless we have reason to say otherwise, we will assume that all mitzvahs are the same. Shemitah will be representative of all mitzvahs, and just as Shemitah we know for sure was conveyed at Sinai, so too all the mitzvahs we can assume were conveyed at Sinai. That's what Rashi says over here. That's Rashi's comment to the first verse of our parsha, the first comment in our parsha. And it seems like a very ancillary point. Don't make the mistake that some mitzvot were conveyed elsewhere. You know, the Jewish people spent 40 years in the wilderness and they stopped in 42 different locations. And the narratives that we find at the plains of Moab are quite, are, are quite vast. So you may have assumed that maybe some mitzvot were originally conveyed at the plains of Moab. No, says Rashi, all the mitzvahs were conveyed at Sinai, and Moshe may have told it to us piecemeal, some at Sinai, some in the plains of Moab, some elsewhere along the journey, but they were all initially conveyed to Moshe at Mount Sinai. Now, why is this important? Why is it significant? Why does it matter the location where God conveyed the laws to Moshe? Is that a good question? Is that a fine question? I think I think it's a legitimate question. And the answer probably, I would imagine, is that this tells us that when Moshe had the most incredible experience ever experienced by any human, goes up to heaven, spends 40 days and 40 nights in heaven with God, and the angels doesn't eat, doesn't drink, doesn't sleep for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Talmud tells us he had to negotiate with the angels. The angels didn't want him there. That is the most remarkable experience ever experienced by any, any human. And when he was there, that's when he got the Torah. All the details. Now, after Sinai, Moshe never went back. So at Sinai, he went up three times, we know. Once to get the Torah, comes back with the first set of tablets. And that doesn't end well. He had to shatter the tablets when he witnesses, when he sees the golden calf and the revelry surrounding the golden calf. He goes up a second time for 40 days and 40 nights to secure forgiveness and goes back a, th- a third time to receive the second set of tablets. But once they leave Sinai, Moshe does not ascend to heaven anymore. Doesn't Transition, so to speak, to that other dimension, that other realm. So it's important for us to know, I think this is maybe the subtext of Rashi, that when Moshe received the Torah, all of it, he got it from the heavens. The Talmud tells us that the Torah is no longer in the heavens. Torah is low it's not in the heavens. It's been emptied from heaven. It's been drained 
from heaven. And although the Torah remains godly, it remains heavenly, which is a a subtle point. But maybe this is the inference here in Rashi. Moshe, he received the Torah by going up there. He received all of it. Every single law, every single mitzvah, he received it by going up to its source, to its root, so to speak, in the heaven, and pulling it down and bringing it down from there. But I want to ponder something a bit more basic. And we've spoken about this in the past, but today we go a bit deeper. Rashi is teaching us that it's important for us to know something. We have to know that the mitzvos, all the mitzvos, the, the, the general principles of all the mitzvos and the, the details and the minutia, all the laws of the mitzvos, they were all given to us. Moshe receives it from the Almighty, he conveys it to us. And they were all done at Sinai. And even though we only discover some of them later on, there, there are some mitzvahs that only appear in the book of Devarim and Deuteronomy, for example, many mitzvahs. Don't think he got it then, he actually got it earlier, and he conveyed it to us only then. That's what Rashi is telling us. But there's one mitzvah, the mitzvah of our parsha, that's singled out to serve as the example of as the stand-in for all mitzvos to teach us that just as that is Sinai Attic, so to all others. If our parsha was talking about some other law, the law of Shabbos, the law of the of the Kohanim of the priests, the laws of the mezuzah of Tefillin of Tzitzis, and we're told the mitzvah, God spoke to Moshe at Mount Sinai. Rashi would say the same thing. Rashi would say, well, why does that have to say that he's told him at Mount Sinai? Don't we know we've been at Mount Sinai ever since the middle of, of Exodus? And he would have answered, well, this teaches us that all the mitzvahs were taught at Sinai. Meaning, there could have been any mitzvah you imagine to stand and to represent all the mitzvahs of the Torah. And the one that was chosen was Shemitah. And therefore, the commentaries tell us something very powerful. Shemitah, this law, you get to the land, and the land must lay fallow, must have an agricultural Shabbos. This is emblematic of mitzvahs in general. If you want to find one mitzvah to represent, to be a stand-in for all mitzvahs, you want to see the forest, so to speak, and not just the trees, every once in a while, it's, it's helpful to zoom out and look at the 30,000 foot view, the 50,000 foot view and see the big picture. Of course, the myriad plethora of details is important, but to see the big picture, we have 630 mitzvahs. And even that, the Gona Vilna tells us, that's really categories of mitzvahs. Everything we do in our life, can be a mitzvah. Every single act, every single thought, every single word that emerges from our mouth, it can all be a mitzvah. And it would fit into one of the 613 categories of mitzvahs. What's the overarching goal? What is it all about? Distill it to its essence. Crystallize it for me. What's the bottom line? The bottom line can be found in mitzvos that represent all mitzvos. And in our parsha, we learn about Shemitah. Shemitah represents all mitzvos. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us to examine this mitzvah and to find out what is its secret. Why is this the one, the proper one, the appropriate mitzvah to represent all mitzvos? Now, this question has been posed many times before. And today we're going to offer a variety of different answers, a variety of different angles as to how Shemitah, how this moratorium on agricultural work in Israel, it's only the land of Israel. Every seventh year, the agricultural Sabbath, how this is an apt representation of what the overarching goal of all of Torah, of all of Metzos is. So the most basic idea, and we spoke about this in the Rebroadcast, podcast. The most basic idea is that this mitzvah 
shows us how we're supposed to live our lives. You think about it. You know, we have, we have the government today. Big government. And you drive around and the government tells you where to stop and, uh, when to drive. And God forbid someone needs help, disability, social security, EBT, Medicaid. We have this social safety net and we have the mighty army and the Navy and NASA and we have satellites and we, we have a government and we have security and we know there's the police. And if God forbid someone's in trouble, you call 911 and right away they'll swoop down to help you. Now, a lot of people, especially fans of the podcast, they don't want to rely on the government. They want to rely on themselves. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I got this little uh, this little kick to go read about some of the, the preppers, the survivalists. Got to have your everyday carry. What kind of knife and how many bullets and how to learn how to restart society and agriculture in the case, in case there's a, an asteroid that hits. How to prepare and the bunkers and all that. So I was relying on something. If you think about it, you rely on the companies that make your products and the companies that make your food and the big government, or you rely on yourself. But the truth is, the Torah wants us to rely only on God. That's it. Only on God. And really, all of Torah, it's about that. It's about to cease relying on anything that's not God. Anything that's not God, well, that's it's almost idolatry. The government, it's so strong, it's so powerful, what a mighty empire. If you rely on that to the exclusion of God, what does that say? You even you rely on yourself. We have to go to sleep at night to just remember how feeble we are. For eight hours, six hours, five hours, depends how many kids are up. You're lying comatose in bed, completely vulnerable. Why? Because the Almighty wants you to realize that you have to rely on God. You think about how nerve-wracking it is for someone who doesn't rely on God. Well, how do I know that I won't die overnight with an aneurysm? How could you possibly go to sleep? Who's to say that you'll continue breathing at three in the morning? You're not even awake. You're not conscious of it. Maybe you'll forget. Maybe your heart will cease operating. The end game is for us to rely on God. And we have a job. We're an accountant. We're a lawyer. We're a physician. We're a welder or a plumber. We have a job. And the job pays and there's good benefits. And God forbid you get fired, laid off. You get laid off. And there's uh, unemployment and there's other workarounds. Hashem says, for a whole year, I want everyone the whole nation, to stop working. It's an agrarian society. Nobody's working. What about your kids? Who's going to feed them? How will you survive? How will you ensure that there isn't a famine? Oh, we'll just import it from Argentina. They have so much food there, right? There's no importing If you make food, if you produce food, if you grow food, you live, otherwise you die. That's the way it was in antiquity. And God says, rely on me. I got your back. I'll make sure you have plenty of food. Not plenty of food. You'll have enough food. This is what the objective of Torah is. To cease relying on anyone and everyone else and just rely on God. And I told my class on Sunday that the end point of our nation 
is going to be when we come to the realization one way or another that we have no one to rely upon besides for God. No one, nothing, no people, and no government, and no entity can we rely upon only on our Father in Heaven. And I speculated, you know, look at what's happening around the world today. And you realize just how isolated our people are. And, of course, that's primarily felt in the land of Israel and in the international community. And our dear friends, the Americans, and, you know, we love the Americans, we're Americans ourselves. But suddenly, Israel is receiving a, a cold shoulder from the Americans. And just today, the Europeans, a few European countries says, oh, we recognize the state of Palestine. Oh, we look at these people, they deserve a state. Who does Israel have to rely upon? The aforementioned Argentinians, right? Very pro-Israel. Okay, that's one. There's still 200 other countries in the world. Oh, at least you have the Americans, right? They'll give us the veto on the Security Council, and they'll provide us with arms and other support against our enemies. The Talmud tells us that the end point of Messiah at the end, right before Messiah. The final thing we're told is the nation will realize, Ain lanu almi we have no one to lean upon, to rely upon, besides for Avinu Shabbat Shalom, our Father in Heaven. It seems like, just from a reading of what the Talmud says, there has to be a decoupling of American support. Think about it. If the Jews, it's a little bit touchy because, you know, we're Americans and we love this country. We're so fortunate to live here. But ultimately, we're Jews first. And for us, you know, we're kind of torn between the Americans and our brothers and sisters in Israel. But I, I came to the realization, I think, I think this is true. If the Talmud says that before Messiah we have to come to this realization, that means that there must be total isolation when the nation is really forced, compelled to realize that there's no one to rely upon besides for the Almighty. And so long as we have the Americans in our corner and they'll defend us at the Hague and they'll give us the American military economic support, we're not alone. It's a very scary proposition to be alone. But the truth is, of course, we're never alone. The Almighty is always guarding us. And the Americans and the Russians and the Europeans and the Arabs and the Chinese, they're not real powers. There's only one real power. It's only the Almighty. And that's the point that we have to reach one way or the other. The easy way or the hard way. The easy way is when we have all that support, we realize that really they're just... The emissaries of God. And the hard way is when we don't have any support and then the Almighty has to swoop in and, and protect us. But that's what the Torah is telling us in this mitzvah. The mitzvah of, of Shemitah is to simulate this. You don't do a thing. And not, your neighbors don't do either. You can't rely on the neighbor either. Everyone's a farmer and everyone's taking a year off and you're not importing. You're just relying on God. It's like you're going back to the times of eating manna every seven years. That's the goal. And it's terrifying until you realize that not relying on God and relying on feeble, fallible humans, that's much more terrifying to rely on God. God does not slumber, does not sleep. He protects us. When you realize that, some people have the tremendous audacity to say, you know, American politicians, oh, I'm the Shomer Israel. I protect Israel. Someone who's just destined to be eaten by worms and maggots is going to get up and declare that they protect Israel. There's only one who protects us. And one doesn't sleep, and doesn't slumber, it doesn't have any term limits or any 
Checks and balances on his power. He's the only one. And it's hard for us to recognize that. And it's terrifying for us to recognize that until we realize that actually that's the only thing that can give us peace and security and stability and comfort. And that's what we're trying to do with this mitzvah. And if we're going to choose any mitzvah to be representative of all the mitzvahs, this is a very, very good one. Because all the mitzvahs are trying to get us to realize that. And I want to take this a bit further. We'll add a wrinkle. The Midrash tells us, citing a verse in Psalms, Bless Hashem, His angels. Gibore koach, mighty ones of strength. O se devaro, those who do His work. Lishmoa bekal devaro, those who hearken, who heed to the voice of His word. There are people who bless Hashem, and they are like angels. And the Midrash says, who are these people? Who are these angelic people who are so mighty in their faith, who do God's words, who obey, who heed God's words, who hearken to his voice? These are the ones who observe the Shemitah. If you think about it, what the Midrash is telling us is that this mitzvah, the mitzvah where a person says, I am not going to work, no one's going to work, and will just be fed by God. That is an act of a person saying, I don't want to be a human, I want to be an angel. The angel doesn't worry. What's going to be with the economy, the macro economy of my stocks and my 401k? What's going to be with my job? What's going to be with my pension? What's going to be with my benefits? The angel just knows that you rely on God. And when the Torah is telling us to observe the Shemitah, it's telling us, become an angel. Become an angel. And there was a time in history that the nation was on that level. That the whole nation were, were just veritable angels. The Talmud tells us, when the Jewish people said, we will do and we will listen. God says, okay, I have the most comprehensive agreement ever agreed upon by two parties. I'll give you the whole Torah and you commit yourself to it. And the nation says, okay, done, signed, here, let me sign. But but you don't want to hear the details? You don't want to know what it entails? It's going gonna, it's gonna to govern every aspect of your life? It's totally comprehensive? It's it's very serious. It can be tough. No, we'll just sign it. Na'asev and we will do and we will listen. We'll, we'll commit ourselves to it and we'll figure out the details later. Could you imagine trying to sell that to your lawyer? Oh, we're signing this uh, 5,000 uh, page contract that's binding for life. Not just our lives, the lives of our children, grandchildren for thousands of years. Should we read the fine print? Maybe just a, it's like one of those bills that comes to Congress. Everyone has uh, 24 hours to read 8,000 pages. No one reads it. They slip it in with these fancy uh, lawyer talk. They get all the pork in, make sure everyone has their palms greased. I don't want to read it. I'll just sign. The Talmud says, when the Jewish people said, Na'asev we will do and we will listen. God said, so to speak, as it were. Me, Dila, Raz, Ze, Labane, who revealed the secret to my children? Who told them this formulation, we will do, we will listen? These are words of angels. The Jewish people at one time in history, they were angels. They understood that the Almighty would only give us the prescription, the tenets, the laws that are to our benefit. They understood that completely. And they said, we'll sign it. We don't need to know the details. We'll learn the details, of course. But we are in. When they did that, they acted like angels. And that was that sign of a very special time in history. The nation said, we'll do, we'll listen. No due diligence needed. 
Now they might be saying, you get to the land. And there's, that's not a sign of revelation. You don't have all the pomp and ceremony, all the pageantry of Sinai. And you're not eating manna. And you don't have that memory of just a few weeks prior of the splitting of the sea, of the exodus, of the death of the firstborn. Go to the land. Become farmers. And observe the Shemitah. If you observe the Shemitah, you're acting like an angel. You're channeling the sentiments that you expressed at Sinai. And therefore the parasha begins. God spoke to Moshe Bahar Sinai at Mount Sinai. And he says, this is, this is the place where you, you acted like angels. Now I'm telling you how to perpetuate that. How to maintain that. How to continue that. Go observe the Shemitah. When Moshe ascended to heaven, we mentioned this earlier. He had to negotiate with the angels. The angels were very perplexed by the sight of an earthling amongst them. It's like, it's like us if, if there was a Martian that walked into the stadium where the Texans play and marches to midfield. Or you see him in the Madison Square Garden. Where else? Like, what's the center of American life? In the middle of Times Square, a Martian walks and starts directing traffic. I was like, whoa, where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Why is there an alien amongst us? When Moshe sent us to heaven, he was the alien. And the angel said, why is there an earthling here? And the Almighty tells them, well, he's here to get the Torah. And that was way more perplexing. Wait a minute, the, the greatest treasure that you have? That you have been hiding in your treasure house for 974 generations before the creation of the world, and you want to give it to this alien? To flesh and blood? To someone born of a woman? To someone who has the capacity to be subjected to base nature and desire and instinct? Impulses governed by the Yitzhara? That's the argument of the angels. And the truth is, they are right. They are correct. Only angels are truly compatible with Torah. And the nation said, we will do and we will listen. They acted like angels. They ate manna, the bread of angels. They lived an angelic life, a life where they had only reliance on God. You, you have nothing in your pantry tomorrow. You're expecting a delivery from heaven. Well, they might sort of parachute manna to your door. That, that's your plan. That, that, that's the plan. That's an angel. They said the Torah does not belong to humans. It's more appropriate to be here with the angels, and they're right. Only angels can become recipients of the heavenly Torah. We said it. We committed ourselves to it. Now it's our job. God tells Moshe. Moshe tells the people, go harmonize yourself with that, not just at Sinai, but onward. And how do you do that? With the Shemitah. Every single person, every single one. This wasn't just like the special people. Uh, Moshe, you and your family observe the Shemitah. Everyone, 600,000 souls, all of them, all of them have to be like angels. We'll add another wrinkle. It's the second wrinkle we're adding. We're getting a little wrinkly. Old and wise and a bit wrinkly. If you think about it, When Adam did his sin, he was cursed. There was the malediction of Adam. Bezeas apecha tocha lechem, with the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. Adam was cursed. In order to have food, you can't just pull it off the trees. You have to process it. The wheat is inedible. Maybe you could eat it, but it's not real food. You gotta first prepare the ground, plow it, plant it, water it, oversee it, pull out all the weeds. And then it grows, you still can't eat it. 
Got to grind it and separate the chaff and turn it into flour and knead it and bake it. Then only then you have bread. With the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. He's being told it's going to be a lot of work to get to that end point of eating bread. And what happens in Shemitah? Who's, who's sweating? <laughs> who's sweating? No one's on the field. No one's plowing. No one's planting. No one's plucking any weeds. No one's harvesting. They may be sweating on other projects, but it's not on the field. And they survived. And they ate. In effect, in effect, the Shemitah is a suspension, a temporary moratorium on the malediction of of Adam. So maybe it's not, you know, you don't have to have as much food as you would have had otherwise, but you're able to circumvent, so to speak, the curse of, of Adam. You have the food without the sweat. And that I think is maybe another another wrinkle of the objective of, of all mitzvos as manifested by the Shemitah. Now, my brilliant brother-in-law, Shmuley Botnik, he noted that the, the secret of Yovel, Yovel is the, is the super Shemitah, right? That's the night year seven or 14, 21, 28, 35, 42 or 49. It's year 50, which is like a back to back Shemitah. Year 49, it's the, it's the seventh year, right? And it's also the last of this cycle. Year 50 is Again, in a year where there can be no work done in the field. And the commentaries tell us that the secret of Yovel relates to Cain and Abel. And a couple of years ago, the year 5782, in the Parsha podcast, which was re-released this week, we talked more about that. So my brother-in-law observed that the word Cain, the Hebrew name is Kayan, which has the same root as kinyan, which means to acquire, something that you own, something that you acquire. Whereas the word able is, is heva, which means futility or, or dissociation. Yovel, when someone says, I'm not going to work in the field, I'm not going to own the field, I'm not even, even the field that I bought, I'm going to return. That is an act of able. It's an act of hevel, an act of determining conclusively that our Oversight, our mastery of the world is hevel, is futility. If Cain is, is Kenyan, is acquisition, it's ownership, it's asserting ownership, it's being territorial over our lands, Yovel is all about stamping out the vestiges of, of Cain from within us. So Adam has two sons before he's expelled from the garden, Cain and Abel, and Abel, unfortunately, is killed by his own brother, and on a Kabbalistic level, we're told that Abel was the good guy, Cain was the bad guy. Well, that's evident from the verse, but everything that's Abel is noble and, and righteous, and Cain has a lot of work to do to improve. And our exercising of these mitzvahs, the Shemitah and the Oval, is all about removing our sense of ownership and entitlement, our vestiges, if you will, of Cain from within us, and as a result, helping rectify the sin of Adam and its after effects. Now, there's another idea here. Another wrinkle. In the laws of Yovel, so this is a little bit later on in the Parsha, chapter 25, verse 23, it tells that how on Yovel, on the 50th year, on the Jubilee year, the Sales, all the sales of ancestral land are all annulled and undone. So if you sold a field to another person, you sold it on year five of the oval cycle, they could own it for 45 years. On year 50, it goes back to the original owner. And the verse says that the land will not be sold permanently. The maximum we have is a 50 year lease. Why? Why can't the land be sold permanently? 
You own it. We believe in ownership. We believe in the concept that the Almighty gives the world to us. And if I own something, well, it's mine. So how come you cannot sell your ancestral land? You can't sell it permanently. So the verse continues, Kili Ha'aretz, the land belongs to me. And the Sephora, one of the great commentators on the Torah, he has an incredible line. The verse says, Hashomayim, Shomayim Lahashem. The heavens, the heavens are God's. But the land, Ve'aretz, and the land, Nasan Ravne Adam. He gave it to humanity. Who owns the land if you own a property? You own land. It's yours. God says, I'm giving this to you. Humanity owns it. So you could buy it, you could sell it. Says the Sephora, that is true with all lands, with the exception of one land. There's one land that the might does not give to humanity. And that's the land of Israel. The heavens, that's God's. He never gave that to us. The earth is ours. The earth with the exception of one land. There's one land that's still his. And thus, we have all these laws that apply only in the land of Israel. All the agricultural laws apply only in the land of Israel. The Shemitah, the Yovel, it's only in the land of Israel. Lots of the laws of tithing, for example, apply only in the land of Israel. So the land of Israel is a, is a special land, and the Shemitah laws, part of it is about recognizing the distinct godly nature of this particular land. There's something special about the land of Israel. Rashi later on in the Torah, tells us the astonishing fact that really the only way to properly fulfill any mitzvah, any mitzvah, even non-agricultural mitzvahs, the proper way to fulfill it is only, is exclusively in the land of Israel. And of course, you have to keep it everywhere, but on a fundamental, essential level, it's really only, you're only able to, to tap into the vast spiritual powers of every mitzvah, only in the land. The Talmud tells us that the mitzvah of settling the land, it's equal to the rest of the mitzvahs combined. There's something different about this land. It is the archetype of all the mitzvahs. And here we have an idea. If you live in the great state of Texas, this land God gave to humanity. If you live in Australia or in the vast steppes of Asia or somewhere in Europe or somewhere in North America, yes, even Canada and North Africa and South Africa and South America and Antarctica and any place in between and on the International Space Station. You are living a land that God gave to humanity. But there's one land that God did not give to us. It's, it's still His. It's like the heavens. That's the land of Israel. And this is why God dictates what happens here. Everywhere else, the land is yours. Here, it's God's. Uh, this idea that I've, I, I saw this year in the Sephora I think it's a fascinating perspective. Why is this land different than all other lands? You know, well, we, we wonder, why can't Israel be a country like any other country? Why can't they have legitimacy? Why can't everyone just let it be? Zionism was supposed to solve the Jewish problem. There was so much anti-Semitism. The only way to solve it is to have our own land. And we have our own land. And we haven't solved the problem. Anti-Semitism is on the rise again. The Euro- European countries, they want to recognize the state of Palestine. It's, it's a tiny sliver of land. 
It's like an average size Texas ranch. You know, the old, the old joke is why is there no 18 hole golf course in Israel? Because if there was, the back nine would be in Jordan. It's so small. And how come we can't just have a, a stable, peaceful life there? I think this is the answer. He lead Kalaretz, the land is mine, God says. What, what does that mean? In the land of Israel, there's a different set of rules. There's land everywhere else. It's, it's our, it's humanity's land. So if you buy it, it's yours. In this, Israel, you buy it, doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still God's. You fight over it, doesn't matter. It's still God's. And therefore, the only way to really acquire the land it's to be worthy of it. It's to be compatible with it. That's the only way that there will be a solution. I, I think this was a, this is a fascinating insight. This is, it's worth the price of a mission. All of these brilliant diplomats and theologians and politicians and the cartographers, God bless the cartographers. We've got this line and that line and the purple line. You look at the Trump peace plan. Just what it took to carve out all the different parts. This will be Israel. This will be Palestine. Everyone will be happy. We'll do the, the tunnel over here and the overpass over there. Incredible land swaps. Amazing. The cartographers working so hard. God bless them. The only way there will be a solution is if a people if a nation, if our nation says we want to be worthy of living in God's land. There used to be a joke that someone said, the Arabs don't want the Jews to have a state. If all the Jews got up and they moved to Madagascar, the Muslims will rise up and say, no, 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 that's our fourth holiest site. That's the joke people used to say. I don't think it's true. I think if the Jews moved to Madagascar, They'll be able to settle there. They'll do fine there. Maybe for other reasons, they won't do fine there because ultimately the nation has to be back in the land. There's something about this land that's different. This land is God's. He did not relinquish ownership of it. And therefore, the way to acquire it, it's not with steel it's not what tanks. It's not with international legitimacy at the United Nations. It's not with the support of the Americans or the Soviets or the Chinese or the Saudis or Abraham Accords or Oslo Accords or any sort of Accords, not the Camp David Accords or any other one. There's only one way to, to live there. And that's to be worthy of being a citizen in God's land. And I'm going to say this now. I'm going to risk my reputation on this. It's not so bad. It's towards the end of the podcast. Most of you already tuned out already, of course. But I, I'm going to risk my reputation and say that the only solution is for the nation, based upon this Sephorno. The land is God's. It's a verse in our parsha. The land is God's. It's not a land that we could do whatever we want in it. It's ours. I own it. You know, in Texas, there's no, there's no, in Houston, there's no zoning. So if you want to make a gas station on your property, you could do that. That's where they have HOAs. So it's like a, it's a way to kind of have a zoning law. But from the state's perspective, from the city's perspective, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. You want to drill for oil in your backyard? Do it. Do it. You want to build a, 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 a museum? Do it. You want to build a school? Next to a gas station? Next to an industrial plant? No problem. Do whatever you want. That's what happens everywhere else. The land of Israel, it's God's land. It's not ours. And we have the right to live there and to flourish there. If we are worthy, this is one of the big takeaways here. 
the primacy of the land of Israel. The reason why it's so important, why settling it, it's equal to all of Torah. The reason why the, the, the way to fulfill all the mitzvahs is exclusively in the land. What does it mean to live in the land? What does it mean to settle in it? It means to be worthy of it. It's to mean, it means to be that aforementioned angel. And that's what God is saying. You're going to get to the land. You have to live up to the standards of the land. And you had that standard once before at Sinai. You must maintain that. Otherwise, you will be booted. Because this is not a land that you own. It's a land that I own. And this is why, perhaps, again, another wrinkle to this idea. This is from Sinai. At Sinai, you lived up to that. When you get to the land, that is what is expected. I want to end with one final idea. I opened up one of my favorite books called The Megala Amukos, written by one of the great Kabbalists. And the word, or the words Megala Amukos means the revealer of the depths. And it was written by actually an antecedent of mine. I think I'm 13 or 14 generations from the author of the book. But if we're going to go deep and deeper, then we should find the book that says that the title of the book is I'm going to reveal the depths to you, to you. That's a very deep book, astonishingly deep. And he asks our question, why Shemitah? Why, why, if we need to know that all mitzvahs were given at Sinai, why, why is this the mitzvah that represents all the mitzvahs? And he says, oh, I'll, I'll give you four different answers. And he starts with the most simple and basic idea. And then he goes deeper and deeper. And the first one is barely understandable. And it's also fantastically deep. And I'll give you just a few of the ideas that he says. But the other ones are so beyond, so Kabbalistic, way deeper than the scope. Well, not just the scope. They're just way beyond me. So it's you can look it up yourself. It's just fantastically deep. So he says something interesting. And this is only a part of what he says. He, he adds so many more components. It's a masterpiece. What's the connection between Shemitah and Sinai? Why, when we are told about the Shemitah, are we told that it happened at Sinai? So the first thing that he observes is that they're the same thing in that a Shemitah, well, it's every seventh year, but it's part of a larger cycle, right? Year seven is Shemitah, and then year eight is year one of the next Shemitah cycle. So seven, 14, 21, and so on, till 49. And then you have 50. And that's not part of the Shemitah cycle. That's a, a year on its own. That's the oval. So there's a 49 plus 1, 50. What happened at the Exodus? 49 days after the Exodus, we got to Sinai. Well, we were at Sinai a little bit earlier, but we got to Sinai Mountain. And then plus 1, you have... Day 50, and that's the revelation of God, the revelation at Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and the touch point of heaven and earth. Now, of course, we have a mitzvah that mirrors that. We're doing this right now. We're counting the Omer. How do you count the Omer? You count day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. That's one week. Day eight, you say day eight, which is one week and one day. And so on until we arrive at Day 49. And we don't count day 50, right? We count only day 49. Day 50 is, is already Shavuos. So we stop counting after 49. So here's the question. The verse tells us that we're supposed to count to 50. The verse in last week's parsha, chapter 23, verses 16 and 17. You should count from the second day of Pesach, seven full weeks. And then the verse says, Tisbru chamishim yom. You're supposed to count seven weeks of seven and then count 50. Yeah, we only count 49. 
So what he explains is that this is a very, very common idea in the Kabbalistic literature. There are a hundred gates. When, uh, when Isaac, he acquired some land, and it became known as Mea Sha'arm, a hundred gates. And there are 50 negative gates and 50 positive gates. And if someone gets to negative 50, they're done. They've reached the point of eternal destruction. They are at the point of no return. And we're told that the Jewish people in Egypt, they could not stay even a second longer in Egypt because they were on the brink. They were on the precipice of level 50 of impurity. And had they fallen over past the cliff into level 50, they would have been destroyed and lost forever. And then with the Exodus, they're brought back to parity. And they spent 49 days each day climbing one rung of holiness. So for 49 days, they, they're climbing, 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 and they reach the peak on Shavuos. They reach level 50. They have this touch point with heaven. But level 50 is really beyond us because that's a total transformation to a different dimension. And even at Sinai, you recall, the mountain was cordoned off. If you came to close the mountain, you would die. Why? The truth is the nation, they... They are on day 50, but they're really not on level number 50. And therefore, they cannot get too close to the mountain. Now, level 50 is a, it's a complete mystery. It's completely beyond us. And if we simulate this, we count the Omer, we count only 49. Maybe there will be a point in history that we're able to actually have a touch point with level 50. And that's the secret of the oval. Here's a trivia question. Where does the word yovel first appear in the Torah? So you may think, well, the first time we've heard of the oval, it's, it's now, right? The Jubilees, it's only now, right? But the answer is no. It's in chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 13 when the verse is talking about not getting too close to Mount Sinai before the sign of Revelation, lo siga bo, don't touch it. Don't touch the mountain because you will die. If a man touches it, if an animal touches it, they will die. When could you ascend the mountain? Bim yovel, when the yovel blast happens, then you shall ascend the mountain. Now, what does this mean? What does the Yovel mean in this context? So a Yovel, it's also a ram, a ram's horn. So after Sinai, there was a blast of a shofar from a ram's horn. And that was a sign. That was a signal that the Shekhinah, that the Divine Presence has departed. And once the Divine Presence departs, it's okay to touch the mountain. Isn't this a fine coincidence that the name of the, the ram's horn is Yovel? It's a coincidence, right? Of course not. The Megalomuchus is telling us Yovel is level 50. At Sinai, we're on level 49, and there's something happening past the border where it's cordoned off on the mountain that it's a level 50 experience. And the nations cannot get too close. If they get too close, they're going to die. They're not ready for that. They cannot ascend the mountain. Moshe could. No one else can. For 49 days, they're marching to Sinai. And it's seven weeks of seven days apiece. And you don't count day 50 because day 50 is just beyond us. But there will be a time in history. There will come a point in time where the nation will spin out of this cycle of, of sevens and enter this 50th dimension. And whoever does that, when the Yovel actually happens, everyone can ascend the mountain. The bottom line, 
of this podcast is that we're going deep and deeper. This is this is not this is not your grandpa's Parsha podcast. This is advanced stuff. It's it's way more advanced than what I can handle. But if there's a bottom line, it's that a lot is expected of us. Complete reliance on Hashem. Angelic reliance on Hashem. Rectifying the sin of Adam. Eradicating the vestiges of Cain from within us. Coming to live, being worthy of living in God's kingdom, namely in the land of Israel. And hopefully being worthy of level 50. We have our work cut out for us. The Shemitah, in its many dimensions and facets, is a microcosm of what it's all about. And we hope and we pray that we will all be fortunate enough to merit to ascend the mountain of God and to stand tall in His holy place. Level 50. That's the ultimate goal. Of course, we know that, but our objective is to always be climbing. Climb up that mountain. Climb up that ladder always be on the ascent, always deepening our connection to our Creator and His incredible Torah. May we recognize how fortunate we are to study Torah together, to study the Parsha podcast together from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My name is Yaakov Walby. Rabbi Walby at gmail.com is the email address for your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Have a lovely rest of your day. Have a lovely rest of your week and have a lovely, elevating, inspiring, invigorating, and uplifting Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the unending help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.